forces have occupied um, uh, some place called Mokokati in the DRC, in Eastern DRC, which is uh, which is uh, 18 kilometers from the border with Uganda, from Busunga. Um, but of course, um, the, the initial plan has already been effect effected uh, to engage the uh, rebel camps in areas of uh, Kambi Yayua, Belu 1 and Belu 2, Tondoli, and others. So we have been engaging the enemy using um, artillery and the air force. So the ground troops, where the ground troops have so far reached, uh, we may not, uh, we cannot progress. Um, um, we need some few days, very few days. We are working on the road to to um, Semuliki Bridge, from where we shall launch further ground operations against the terrorists. Now, of course, it takes some. Um, some time, it will take some few days, but I, I don't think it's going to take very long. It's just a, few, just a few days. So, you know, the enemy has been preparing and we have also been preparing. We knew that there was that stretch of road, about nine kilometers that we needed to work on to be able, you know, to cross our logistics and the troops ahead to, to, to advance and, and, and engage the enemy. Now the Ministry of Education and other development partners are meeting in Wakiso to join to iron out concerns over the inclusive education for youth with complex disability. Among the resolutions the Ministry plans to embark on is to vocationalize the education program to include disability skills services by equipping institutions with user-friendly training kits. The youth with complex disability are to access inclusive vocational training and market-driven skills to enable them to compete on the labor market. Uganda Association of Private Vocational Institutions, in conjunction with INSEENSE, International Uganda, are supporting the youth with complex disability in Mpumo De Vocational and Rehabilitation Center, Jinja, St. Benedictine Vocational, Tororo, and Mbale School of Deaf, in skills development. The technical expert deaf blindness in Sense International Uganda, Lydia Namachika, calls on government to support such children. In this case, when these students learn skills that can help them to earn uh, a living and be able to provide for themselves, uh, most of the things that they, li they need for independent living, it will help them also to, to build their self-esteem and confidence to believe in themselves that they can also live like any other person and support themselves like any other person. The general manager, Uganda Association of Private Vocational Institutions, Mbayo Samuel says, acquiring employable skills, people with complex disabilities would be able to earn a living. If these people are properly trained in skills, they can be productive and add some wealth to themselves, to their family, and to the nation as well. The uh, partners uh, in education need to ensure that the families are supported. First of all, to raise these children, to make sure that uh, they are prepared for education, and when the education comes, uh, they, they are included. Olinga Swabula, a disabled student, shares her views. I want to also to become a midwife, a great midwife. Also, I want to become a counselor. As an alternative, also I want to grow up and I build an orphanage for, for people, for, for children, for all children who need support, because some lame ch children are orphans. They need, they need our help. I'm Navka Farida and Ganga Henry. West Nile District bordering Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan are at high risk of importing COVID-19 virus due to the porous borders where people, across, people cross easily into Uganda. Launching mass vaccination exercise in Arua City, the Minister for Health, Dr. Jane Ruth Acheng, called upon the people to embrace vaccination against COVID-19 since West Nile is a hot spot for the pandemic. 
Currently, Obongi District, one of the districts of West Nile, has the highest COVID-19 cases in Uganda. This is the reason Minister of Health, Dr. Rotha Cheng, is emphasizing the need for vaccination as the only way to avert the spread of the pandemic. While launching mass vaccination campaign in Arua City, Dr. Rotha Cheng disclosed that the target is to vaccinate 1.9 million people in West Nile. One, we want to vaccinate 1.9 million people. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. In Lango sub-region, we targeted to vaccinate 2.1 million people. Over 75, 77% were vaccinated. You have 1.9, you can do it. You can do it under your operation, take a take a, and vaccinate all the 1.9. I want you to show me that we can do better than even Lango or Chigezi, because those are the sub-regions so far that have performed very well. Currently, Teso, Lango, Acholi, Chigezi and West Nile sub-regions have had the highest infection rates in the country with Obongi district leading. We have launched this campaign so far in four sub-regions, that is Teso, Lango, Acholi, Chigezi, and now West Nile. Why did we choose these sub-regions first? Because these are the sub-regions that we are having very high infection rates. We want to see it drop. We want to see the new cases in Obongi drop so that people can prepare for serious business once the economy is opened. The minister disclosed that there are possibilities of lockdowns in regions with high infections when the country will be fully opened next year. I am hoping that at the end of the campaign, we will be rejoicing with good statistics. I don't want to say prepare for a lockdown because we don't want any more lockdowns. If we don't want a lockdown, vaccinate. Because no longer are we going to have complete lockdowns but regional lockdowns for districts that don't vaccinate. I'm Navka Farida and Joseph Odama. Growth understaffing and underfunding have been cited as some of the constraints derailing ecological monitoring activities at the National Environment Management Authority. This is what recently appointed Executive Director for NEMA, Dr. Akankwasa Balirega, has experienced during his first 100 days in office. Akankwasa says the authority requires 79 billion Uganda shillings, out of which NEMA secured 13 billion, which is short by 71 percent. Henry Okrut reports. In the last three months since National Environment Management Authority got new leadership in September 2021, many things have changed. We've taken a bold decision to stop any further development of any nature in any wetland. New conditions in acquiring environment and social impact assessments have been introduced, a breach of which attracts cancellation. Now the challenge at hand is to regulate the developments that were already approved prior uh, or before 2nd September. These we are enhancing our capacity and we shall close in on them, to monitor them, to guide them, to comply. A lot more would have been achieved if NEMA had secured 100% of the required financial muscle. But then not. The authority is short of funding by about 71%, which according to Dr. Akankwasa, makes operations difficult. We are talking about about 79 billion and we are currently getting 13. Uh, so we are operating below, below, below the minimum threshold. When this is done, ecosystem destruction challenges will be a thing of the past. If the adopted strategies by NEMA are anything to go by.
Once things are automated and they are online, you will be more efficient. You will serve the investors faster. The investors will create jobs. The investors will pay taxes and will generate uh, revenue for the economy. Dr. Akamkwa Sabarirega assumed the office of the executive director NEMA on 1st September 2021. He has since embarked on leading a restructuring exercise aimed at making effective and efficient operations at Uganda's National Environment Management Body. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I have to run away. Henry Okrut, UBC. And uh, colleagues, thank you for sharing. Minister for Finance in charge of investment, Evelyn Anite, says Uganda is here to reduce its expenditure on importation of vehicles from other countries. Inspecting the first truck roll-off assembly line automotive group in Namanve, Minister Anite said a lot of money is going to waste annually on importation of vehicles. In 2019, 20, financial year 2019, 2020, we imported uh, three trillion worth of vehicles in the country of different categories. In 2018, government passed a law stopping importation of used vehicles manufactured before 2007. The move to stop importation of vehicles below 2007 was intended to reduce pollution and dumping in the country. The same move coincided with Uganda's agenda in development of automotive industry. Through assembling and manufacture of vehicles, Uganda has been importing quite a number of vehicles, most of which are already used, posing a challenge to the environment. Of course, in the beginning, Ugandans did resist it, and it was a big challenge, but we've eventually appreciated it because importation of used cars, what does it do? That is importation of DMC, pollution of our environment, because they come when their engines are poor. With the rapid rate of automotive development, several factories like Uganda Automobile Assembly Group, just like Chira Motors, have been able to kickstart production of brand new vehicles. Uganda Automobile Factory located in Namanve is set to kickstart large-scale production of vehicles come 2022 in their factory located in Imbali. We want to make a product that all the people, the Ugandan people, can afford too. We don't make an expensive and beautiful stuff. We don't have to like make huge money. We just want to make all the people here happy in the future have the ability to buy a car. While flagging off the first truck roll-off, Minister for Finance in charge of investment, Evelyn Anita, says the move to halt importation of old vehicles was a milestone for Uganda's automobile kickoff. Anita says in a few years to come, Uganda will be able to save not only the environment from pollution by DMC imported vehicles, but also to reduce on its expenditure on used vehicles. Minister Anita says government is going to put friendly taxes on automotive production. So for every currency that we donate uh, in importation, that means that we are depreciating our currency and we're making the growth of, we're slowing down the growth of our, of, of our economy. With most of the technical workers sourced in and around the country, this is an enhancement to skills development, reduction of training cost of workers for automobile production, as well as job creation. We are now pushing towards inclusive growth and democratizing investments across this country. Robert Mukiza is the Director General, Uganda Investment Authority. Uh, uh, workers uh, that work in these industries they don't have the technical skills uh, uh, to actually uh, sustain the industry. So you find uh, that the industry has spent a lot of money on training costs on upgrading these skills. So I find uh, the experience here very critical uh, because they are training a lot of the technical uh, uh, workers uh, that are relevant for automotive industry. Upon completion, however, Uganda Automobile Group Factory will not only assemble, but produce both heavy-duty and low-duty vehicles, including patrol vehicles, military cargo vehicles, ambulances, box body refrigerator vehicles, among others. It will also produce spare parts for all vehicle types. Susan Naonga, reporting for EBC TV. 
Residents of Bali constituency Kayunga district have appealed to the Prime Minister's office to fulfill the pledge of buying them land so that they can get fully resettled. The over 2,000 were displaced after heavy rains destroyed houses and property in December 2019. They decry the hard conditions they are going through in the camp where they are staying at the moment. The rising water levels in Lake Choga and River Sezewa led to the displacement of over 2,000 people in Galilaya sub-county, Bale constituency in Kayunga. Most affected were people of Ntimba, Kawongo, Kampatanya and Chedicho village where all gardens and houses were submerged by water. <laughs> The displaced are now settled in this camp. Lack of nearby hospital and food is their biggest challenge. Their wish is to see the Prime Minister Robin Anabanja fulfill the pledge of buying them land where they can permanently resettle plus putting up technical schools for the O and A level dropout students. <laughs> The NRM flag bearer for the Kayunga district by election, Andrew Mwonge, pledged to report their concerns to government and also ensure they are resettled. Time by time, we pray that uh, as time goes on, it will reduce. Because you see these were people's gardens. Right now, uh, you see boats are, are, are packed here, are, are landed here. So we pray that water reduces so that people can go back to their daily life. Meanwhile, Godfresh Wanda Subi, the NRM vice chairperson, Buganda region, has camped in Kayunga to create room for other government and party leaders who are expected to join the NRM team already on the ground. The biggest challenge you have in Kayung has been land. We have issues with land. But I want to tell you, the issue of land is not going to be handled by one person. After all, we've been having these same people who are claiming that they are land masters. And I want to, work, I want to assure you that's one of the roads that we are going to begin with under this term. Why? I'm Nafka Farida and Robert Katamba. UBC Lunchtime News takes a short break, but we'll return with more stories. Don't move an inch. Yellow Uganda, congratulations and thank you for buying shares in MTN Uganda. We look forward to a brighter future together. MTN will keep you updated with important information about your shares via SMS, our website and our official social media channels. Grab an ice cold bottle of Pepsi Max today and drink to your bold lifestyle. Enjoy maximum taste with no sugar. Now available at a shop near you. Maximum taste, no sugar. Introducing Learn From Home Data Bundles. Customized bundles for you and your family to study or work seamlessly from the comfort of your home. Use any of these affordable data bundles to connect to your MiFi, routers, laptops, tablets and smartphones while avoiding unwanted internet exposure and ensuring undivided attention during online classes. Enjoy instant access to Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet and selected educational websites. Websites. Dial star 175 hash to buy your learn from home bundle today. Airtel, the smartphone network. Terms and conditions apply. Raising voices. Like other fathers across Uganda, I'm standing up to send no to violence against children. I commit to give my children a violence free childhood. As fathers, we can make Uganda safer for our children. I promise to speak out 
when I see virus. In this time of COVID, what is your promise to the children of Uganda? Because a violence-free childhood is everyone's right. Raising Voices. Ministry of Health, through the National TB and Leprosy Program, together with partners, has organized the 4th National Tuberculosis and Leprosy Annual Stakeholders Conference, scheduled for the 9th through the 10th of December 2021 at Imperial Resort Beach Hotel, Entebbe. It will run on a theme, Accelerating Progress Towards the 2022 United Nations High-Level Meeting Targets in COVID-19 Era. The guest of honor will be Dr. Jenrutha Cheng Ochero, Minister for Health. The event will be live on UBC TV and social media platforms. Yellow Uganda, congratulations and thank you for buying shares in MTN Uganda. We look forward to a brighter future together. MTN will keep you updated with important information about your shares via SMS, our website and our official social media channels. Welcome back from that break and now taking a look at what's happening in the international scene as part of efforts to redefine the country's national COVID-19 response and build the health security framework for the country. The Nigerian COVID-19 summit is to host Dr. Anthony Fauci. Now the SGF noted that the summit would be an August assemblage of key actors in the health, economic, security and policy making sectors of the country. Nigeria's COVID-19 summit, the first of its kind in the West African nation. Among other issues, government officials, global partners and public health stakeholders all gathered in the nation's capital to discuss Nigeria's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But despite the gains, mutations of the virus continue to pose new challenges for Nigeria. The UK and Canada have imposed travel restrictions on Nigeria over the Omicron strain. Those other countries are reacting the way they should react because they're not sure. I mean, if you are told that the thief is coming near your house, you don't wait to say, I want to see the thief before I, 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 I protect myself. So you protect yourself when you hear it. And that's what they have done. It's for us to also react that way and guard ourselves. Not much is known about the new Omicron variant. That's why the World Health Organization is pushing for more research on COVID-19. We encourage the Nigerian government to, to heighten uh, genomic surveillance and sequencing. We encourage the Nigerian government to, to undertake inv adequate investigation in the field to understand the status of the, not only this variant, but also the, the virus uh, itself. Uh, studies uh, are going on. We need to, to remain uh, uh, vigilant uh, as we continue to implement our um, Public health measure. The Nigerian government hopes to achieve herd immunity by mid next year. Like several African countries, the West African nation is largely dependent on foreign countries for COVID 19 vaccines. And that's why conversations around producing vaccines locally are making headway here. I think the vaccine injustice, as has been said in this summit, is a wake up call for all African countries to relook. Um, in what we are calling the new public health order that includes looking at local productions for not only vaccines but diagnostics and therapeutics. The Nigerian government says the summit is a wake-up call for all stakeholders to work towards closing the COVID-19 response gaps and try to ensure that the country hits 70% vaccination target for its eligible population in 2022.
Now, China warned on Tuesday the United States would pay China the price w- for a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics of human rights concerns. Now, the U.S. move, which stopped short of preventing athletes from attending, comes after Washington spent months wrangling over the position to take on games beginning in February next year over what it has termed China's genocide of the Uyghur minority. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian made the remark at a daily briefing on Tuesday. The step taken by the U.S. is in violation of the principle of political neutrality upheld by the Olympic Charter. It also goes against the Olympic model of together and all the athletes and sports lovers in the world. China opposes this. The U.S. should stop political. All right, now with that, we hand you over to State House for the International Anti-Corruption Day celebrations. I'm Lorraine Masika Kazimoto. Have a good afternoon. Okiria. to this function when we commemorate the International Anti-Corruption Day. Ladies and gentlemen, may you remain standing so that we can have the national anthems and the prayer. Excellency, our chief guests, distinguished guests, 
We are honored to have their graces and eminences from the Interreligious Council represented at this function. I hereby would like to take the opportunity to recognize them. We ask them to nominate a representative to lead us in a prayer, and they duly nominated Bishop Joshua Luere. May I invite Bishop Joshua Luere to, get, to grace this occasion with a word of prayer. Bishop, you're welcome. Shall we pray? Father God in heaven, we stand here as a nation today in shame of ourselves, although we commemorate the Global and Corruption Day. As a nation, we are ashamed of our ways before you because we've corrupted our ways. And so we stand here first and foremost to confess our sins that are not hidden from your eyes but are so detestable before you. But we stand on your promise when you say in Isaiah 118, come and we reason together. Even though your sins are like crimson, they will be as white as snow. Lord, the level of our corruption in this country has reached epidemic proportions far worse than Ebola and COVID because it is resulting into so much poverty, ignorance, and so much direct and indirect death. So I start with us, the priests and your prophets, whom you've called to speak for you. It seems, Lord, that corruption has started with us to neutralize us as the light and the salt that we are supposed to be to stop that corruption among our people. Lord, there is so much corruption in the pulpit that we do not have the authority to be the conscious of the nation. We admit, Lord, our failure before you. We have corrupted our ways and have not guided your people. They bring corrupt money in our places of worship, and even when we know many times that it is ill-gotten money, we still bless them, instead of counseling or reprimanding them. We even tell the rest to emulate them, leaving a false impression that we are God who can bless bribes, who can be bribed by how much people give, and all these such things. Lord, we are very sorry for letting you down, and so we are very sorry for corrupting your altars with unholy incense of the strange fire we bring continually before you to cause your people to trample your courts in pride and in usating sin. We are the main culprits, Lord, and we admit that. We spend so much time in self-glorification, strife, competitions, and jealousies. We have not loved the sheep so much as to restrain, not to restrain ourselves from telling them the full truth to their eternal, for their eternal benefit. They have not seen in us the life of sacrifice that our Lord demonstrated while here on earth. We have preached a strange gospel and therefore given them another spirit, not your spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us for being blind guides and hirings rather than true shepherds who lay down their lives for the sheep. Lord, in politics, everyone focuses on himself, Mfunirawa, Ndiawa, Man eateth where he worketh with the popular talk. We scramble and snatch the best pie whenever opportunity shows up. Lord, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon our politicians at all levels, national and local. Like, the, like us, the shepherds, some have, fel, have become ferocious wolves, ready to devour your people. We are daily sinking into debt as a nation leaving an unbearable burden and a terrible legacy to the next generation. How shall we escape your righteous judgment? We even teach our children to buy votes in schools, in colleges, and universities. We give money to young children in kindergartens. We give them sweets to bribe, meaning that their generation will even be worse than ours. Lord, incest is rampant in the homes, what we are leaving behind for our children and children's children, Lord, is not the legacy that you want us to leave. Many professionals, especially teachers and doctors, 
who bear the survival and meager salaries while they persevere and sacrifice for the rest of us are so discouraged whenever they hear about the billions of individuals plunder every day. When they compare their meager salaries to the politicians, Lord, in parliament, in local government, in other positions of leadership, yet they have spent years studying. Lord, how can we encourage them unless you help us to do it? Where can they get the hope that maybe something will be better soon? Lord, please visit us. Visit our doctors, visit our teachers, visit our nurses, visit our health workers, encourage them and assure them so that they can go back and work. Help them understand that you are just God who does not cheat. You yourself will pay them commensurate to their labor and sacrifice, even when we have no money to pay them sacrificially or satisfactorily as they expect. Some have even gone to other countries, yet we have spent a lot of money to train them. Today we plead with you, Lord our God, to have mercy upon us, to really give us a new beginning. The people we lead are tired. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They feel oppressed and have nowhere to run. They no longer believe that we are their best interest at heart. Even when we speak to them, they don't listen. They no longer believe. There's so much apathy in the countryside. We tell them that we are launching a new anti-corruption campaign, and they're indifferent. They are saying, Agomalia Gassente. They're sarcastic, and they answer mockingly. Lord, this is a very painful and desperate situation we're in. Therefore, we really need you, and we need your visitation. Lord, what can we do? Send us a revival like you did in the middle of the 1930s. Bring back that fear, the fear of God in our lives, and the genuine repentance in the hearts of our people. Restore us, Lord, and the fortunes of this country. Now we commit this new campaign in your hands today. Let this be different this time. May you really rally your people again let them give us another chance as we go out with a seriousness like we've never done before. Help us mobilize this nation to stamp out corruption, this monster that we have failed to conquer. Go ahead of us, Lord. Help us, Lord, you as our commander, go throughout this country and help us establish these community monitoring groups at every district, sub count and parish level, so that your people will have courage again to demand accountability from duty bearers. And so that the parish development model will this time around succeed. We pray that the lifestyle audit we are launching today will be a vocabulary on the people's lips in Uganda. As we search for you, we totally depend on you, Lord. We rely on you because without you, we can't do it. Lord, we pray in a special way for our president. We pray for the IGG and the anti-corruption agencies, Lord our God, that will work together as one team. We thank you. Lord, we bless you this day. In Jesus' name, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Luere, Your Excellency, um, the President of the Republic of Uganda, Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Uganda, His Lordship, the Chief Justice, the Honorable Members of Parliament, Honorable Ministers, members of diplomatic corps, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this function when we commemorate the International Anti-Corruption Day. Your Excellency, we have been joined by a number of distinguished guests. We are honored to have them join us at this function today. And I would like to, to take this opportunity to recognize their presence we are honored
to have them here. They took off their time to join us. And Your Excellency, at this event, we, 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 we recognize the fact that when we organized this, we worked together as a team with the anti-corruption agencies who are also represented here. Uh, Your Excellency, we have been, represent, we have been uh, graced by the Vice President, Her Excellency Honorable Jessica Alupo. We have the Deputy Speaker, Justice Alphonse Owindolo, sorry, the, the Chief Justice, Justice Alphonse Owindolo. Your Excellency, we have the Minister of Office of the Presidency, Ms. Mariam Doka Babalanda. We also have the Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, Mr. Francis Mwebesa. We have the Minister of State, Office of the President, Ethics and Integrity, Honorable Akelo Roslili. We have the Minister of State, Office of the Prime Minister for Northern Uganda, Honorable Kweo Ching, Grace Freedom. Your Excellency, we have also been joined by the Minister of Lands, Housing and Urban Development, Mr. Sam Mayanja. We have the Minister of State for Local Government, Honorable Victoria Rusoke. We have the Minister of State for Public Service, Ms. Grace Mary Mugasa. We have the Minister of State for Trade and Industry and Cooperatives, Honorable Bahati David. We have the Minister of State for Trade and Industry and Cooperatives, Honorable Gume Frederick Ngobi. Your Excellency, we have been joined by diplomatic corps and, and development partners who have been supporting the anti-corruption agencies in implementation of a number of activities. I hereby would like to recognize um, the United Nations Residence Coordinator, His Excellency Mrs. Susan Mary Namondo. We have the representative from USAID, Mr. Tim Stein. And we have the head of the component from the GIZ, Mr. Aina Fogg. Your Excellency, in the interest of time, we have also been um, joined by some members uh, of the Parliamentary Forum on Ethics and Integrity. We have chairpersons of Accountability Committee of Parliament. We have got religious leaders, Sheikh Hamid Zerwada Busungu, representing his eminence, Sheikh Shaban Mubadje. We have got Bishop Paul Semogerere. We have got Bishop Joshua Lwere, who has just led us in a prayer here. We've got Apostle Dr. Joseph Serwada and Mr. John Shitakule. Your Excellency, we have also permanent secretaries represented here. We have got the principal private secretary to the president, Dr. Kenneth Omona. We have got um, the sec secretary health service commission, Ms. Mary T. Wenene. We've got the secretary, the IG, Ms. Ms. Cafero Rose, represented here. Your Excellency, we also have members of the interagency forum the interagency forum which brings together all agencies in the fight against corruption in Uganda. We have got the Inspector General of Government, Honorable Betty Kamia to Romwe. We have the State House Anti-Corruption Unit Head, Kano Edith Nakalema. We have the Auditor General, Mr. John Muanga. And we've got the head Financial Intelligence Authority, Mr. Sidney Asubo. We've got the Uganda Revenue Authority, Commissioner General, represented by Mr. James Abola. And we have 
Public Procurement and Dispose of Assets Authority Executive Director, Mr. Ben Benson Turamwe. Your Excellence, we have the Director of Public Prosecutions, Justice Jen Francis Sabodo. Your Excellency, we have the Director General Internal Security Organization, Colonel Charles Oluka. And we have the Deputy Inspector General of Government, Mrs. Anne Tunumgisha Muheire. Your Excellency, we have the Chief of Defense Forces representing the security. Uh, we have General Peter. Eluelu, Deputy CDF. We have the Inspector General of Police, represented by AIGP Andrew Sorowen. And we have the Commissioner General of Prisons, represented by Director Samuel Akena. Your Excellency, we have also been honored to get representations from the civil society organizations and their representatives here. We, we have got the Anti-Corruption Coalition of Uganda. We have got Transparency International. We have got Renzori Anti-Corruption Coalition and a number of anti-corruption agencies represented here. Your Excellency, we have got uh, Honorable Oboth, Minister of State for Defense, Honorable Oboth Oboth represented here. We have the Zero Tolerance Corruption Policy Steering Committee, and this is a committee that has been very instrumental in the fight against corruption. We have got uh, the committee represented here. Your Excellency, we also have the anti-corruption agencies, the technical team, the staff. We have got directors from the Inspector General of uh, Inspectorate of Government represented here. Please stand up for recognition, the technical team from, the, direct, from uh, the Inspectorate of Government. We have directors and commissioners from the Directorate for Ethics and Integrity. We have the team from the Auditor General and directors of the Auditor General's Office represented here. And we have directors from PPDA represented here. We have got the technical team from the Directorate of Public Prosecution from the police, from the internal security organization, and we are also having the young people's, the, the, the National Youth Council represented here, and the Uganda National Students Association represented here. So your excellency, we realize borrowing, taking your guidance on Kisanja Akuna Muchezo, we realize that the fight against corruption is not a joking subject anymore. And this is the reason why you see a number of partners represented here. We have got partnership and strategic alliances with a number of institutions and organizations uh, uh, that support the fight against corruption in the country. Your Excellency, following the program, we will now have, um, but before we have uh, the Deputy IGG giving her remarks, we have Honorable Harriet Ntabazi, Minister of State for Trade, represented here. Thank you very much, Honorable, for coming. Your Excellence, we have uh, Ms. Anne Tuinomgisha Muheire, the Deputy Inspector General of Government, who will be making remarks shortly. She's also the President of Uganda Christian Lawyers Fraternity and has been driving the integrity campaign for the youth in Uganda. Your Excellency, Ms. Anne previously worked with the Minister of Defense, Veteran Affairs, where she left a very, very tremendous impact. It is now my single honor and privilege to invite Ms. Anne Muheire, the Deputy Inspector General of Government, to make the welcome remarks. Thank you very much, and you're welcome. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, General Yore Kaguta Museveni, the Vice President, 
the Honorable Chief Justice. In the interest of time, all protocol is observed. Ladies and gentlemen, this event has been organized in collaboration with the anti-corruption agencies. And on my behalf, and on behalf of these anti-corruption agencies, we would like to cordially welcome you all to this year's commemoration of the International Anti-Corruption Day. Allow me at this point, Your Excellency, to recognize and thank the different anti-corruption agencies under the umbrella of the Inter-Agency Forum. These are the Directorate of Ethics and Integrity Day under the able leadership of our Minister, Honorable Akelo Lili. Office, Office of the Auditor General, the Internal Auditor General, the Accountant General, Office of the Directorate of Public Prosecutions, Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Authority, State House Anti-Corruption Unit, Financial Intelligence Authority, Criminal Investigations Directorate of Uganda Police Force, Leadership Court Tribunal, the Anti-Corruption Division of the Courts of Judicature, the Uganda Revenue Authority, Internal Security Organization, the Public Service, Judicial Service and Health Service Commissions. Thank you all for organizing such an important and wonderful event. Your Excellency, on the 31st of October 2003, the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 584, which designated the 9th day of December as the International Anti-Corruption Day. This day was established to promote awareness about corruption, its dangers, and avenues of combating and preventing it.